So this is when things called relayers come in, where they will basically be listening to the hub. They will see some event occurred. So they'll see, oh, some packet was sent. And this will all be outputted via the event system. And the relayer will pick up on this. It'll get the information about the packet, reconstruct it, because in the Cosmos Hub state, it only stores the um, packet hash. It does not store the packet itself. The packet is outputted via the event system. So the relayer picks up that packet, reconstructs it, and then it takes it to Ethereum and it hands it to Ethereum and it says, here's a packet that I want to relay. You should process it. And so the first thing Ethereum will want to do, will want to verify that indeed this packet that is being uh, received on my end was actually sent by the Cosmos Hub. It wants to make sure that the packet hasn't been like tampered with, that the information hasn't been changed, and that the Cosmos Hub actually committed to sending that packet, wants to check that that packet has not yet timed out. And so it will do all of this in, at the channel layer using a handler. And so it will verify all of those things. It will check all of that. And it will verify using the connected IBC client that the hub actually stored this hash of this packet under this specific key that we know beforehand. And it will verify that using a proof, using historical data that was um, when the hub produced a block in the past, basically the uh, light client on Ethereum is updated to that block. And then we use that information to verify that this packet was also stored inside of this block and committed to. And if that is successful and it's all good, then the Ethereum will go to its application corresponding to that channel and port. And it'll say, this packet has been sent from the hub and you should process it. And then the application would take it. It would take the data, decode it. It would see, oh, this was a transfer um, from the hub to Ethereum. I should mint tokens corresponding to this denomination and give it to this uh, user account, which the uh, tokens were sent to. And if, that, if the application goes well, then Ethereum will write what's called an acknowledgement. And this acknowledgement is information on the Ethereum side of Ethereum basically saying, I have received this packet and I have processed this packet. And now I'm committing to the fact that I have processed this packet. So it has this acknowledgement and it takes the hash of it and it stores it on its blockchain and it commits a block so that the hub can eventually verify it. And the acknowledgement is emitted via events and the relayers will see this packet was processed on Ethereum and now an acknowledgement has been admitted. And you'll pick up on that, reconstruct the acknowledgement, take it to the hub and it'll say, hey, this acknowledgement was processed on Ethereum. And it'll go through a very similar steps that uh, Ethereum did. It will check to make sure that um, the acknowledgement is valid. It'll take the hash. It will verify that this hash was committed into the state of Ethereum using its client that it has representing Ethereum. And then it will verify that this acknowledgement was stored there in state. And if that is all successful, then it will go to the application again and it'll say, hey, Ethereum acknowledged this packet. Here's the acknowledgement data and you should process it. So in the transfer case, there's two acknowledgements that we have. One of them is the transfer was successful. In that case, we don't do anything. Um, and the other case is the transfer failed. So a user tried to send tokens to Ethereum, but for some reason, Ethereum said it could not receive those packets. And so it returned a failed acknowledgement. In this case, the tokens were never minted on Ethereum. So we actually want to refund those tokens. So that gives the application a chance to actually kind of revert any things that occurred during the packet send that maybe shouldn't happen since the packet actually never got successfully sent. And so that kind of brings a, to completion the uh, pretty much like the happy path of IBC from bottom to top, where we create clients, we establish connections between two IBC clients. 
Then we start creating channels on top of those connections, which allow applications to send packets back and forth. And relayers will then take those packets and deliver them to the other chains. And the chains will verify and make sure everything's good. And they will make callbacks to the applications to process any information. There's some other um, important areas for security. So packets can be timed out. So every time a packet is sent, it has timeout information. This timeout information is um, the time at which the packet should uh, no longer be received on the receiving chain using the receiving chain's block height and its block time. So I could say, I want this packet to be sent, but if it's not received by Tuesday, then it should never be received and I just want to revert all the things that occurred in the send packet. So the sending chain can process timeouts and it can check that indeed this packet has not been received and um, we should kind of go to the application. We say, hey, this packet timed out. You probably want to do something like uh, give back the user its tokens. There are um, other small details like channels can have a type. So in most use cases, when we send packets, we don't care about their ordering. So I can send packet one, five, eight, in whatever order, and they can be received in whatever order. And this works for transfer because users transfer, uh, user send, a user sending tokens to an address does not need to be correlated with a different user sending tokens to another address. We don't need to receive these packets in order. But there are order channels um, which do require that the packets be received in order. But order channels are kind of hard to use because if one packet times out, that basically renders the uh, order channel useless because it needs to receive all the packets in order. So if one packet times out, then it can no longer receive them in order. So then the channel closes. So we wouldn't want that for transfers because then you might have tokens stuck on one chain. I send my tokens to the other chain and then the channel closes and I can't send them back and get my original tokens. And then there is one last kind of detail, which is also important, which is that like clients, the things we use to verify, they can be tricked because they're allowed to kind of jump blocks from block one to block 10. And they have this set of security parameters. Since they're not verifying every block, it's possible for malicious validator sets to kind of trick those like clients into believing this block was actually produced by the hub. But there are uh, pretty strong security guarantees against that. And it requires, at the very least, in Tendermint's case, greater than one third of the validator set to collude. So normally, to produce a block on, the Tendermint, on a Tendermint chain, you need two thirds of a validator set. So at the very least, the light client needs one third to be tricked. But you can actually have, in the client state, you can have parameters which specify how much of the validator set needs to uh, sign over a block in order for it to be verified. So sometimes it's only one third, sometimes it's half, it can be two thirds. Um, it kind of, it, that's where these like client parameters verify. But if the like client does get tricked, then we wanna be able to know that. And so that is what uh, is called misbehavior processing. So if two blocks, let's say the hub produces a block, but then there is a malicious validator set that at the same height produces a different block that's signed by one third. And it updates the IBC client to that malicious block. We want a way to prove to the light client to say, hey, using your verification algorithm, you would say this block and this block, which are different, but produced at the same heights are valid. And if you can prove that to the light client, then we want you to freeze. We don't want you to do any more verifying, packet processing. We want you to just stop until we can kind of figure out what's going on and either uh, kind of manually unfreeze you or update you or just stop dealing with that blockchain altogether because th some weird things are happening with their validator set. Um, so that's where we kind of get some stronger security guarantees. Um, there is no way 
to absolutely fight against this um, ability for validator sets to kind of collude. But IBC is built as defense in depth. So that is one layer of defense. And then there's other ways like delaying packet processing to allow misbehavior to be submitted. Um, but that's kind of more of a minor detail that is still ongoing development. 